Breath of Life presents Relentless Pursuit with Pastor Walter L. Pearson, Jr. The book of Revelation, chapter 3. In fact, on this particular occasion, I will... Uh, read from a parallel of the Bible, Revelation chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. I am standing at your heart's door, knocking. Anyone who hears my voice and opens the door will be glad, for I will come in and eat with him and he with me. He who overcomes will receive the right to sit with me on my throne just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. I've entitled our study for this occasion, House Calls. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we are grateful once again for the opportunity to open the word. There are some who don't have this privilege and they long for it. But today, because it is ours, we are grateful, our hearts are glad, and we dare not sit in silence when the power of the Holy Spirit moves through this place. I only ask, Father, in public what I have asked in private, that all that I have and all that I am may be converted to thy use, and I pray that we shall hear on this day a word from the Lord. This is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. I was shocked when I really thought about it. Um, I'm sure everybody has read this text before, and somehow we reduce the Bible. We bring it down to our own size. But the Bible says that Jesus, in fact, Jesus declares of himself, I stand at the door of your heart, and I stand here knocking. The scholars make it clear that this is not the door of proffered opportunity. This is not the door of salvation. Man does not have the power over those doors. But there is a door that God will not control, and that's the door of my heart. When you think about it, as the Creator, He could knock down the door. He could force His way into your life. But Jesus stands at the door of my heart powerless because he has limited himself and will not force me to let him in. He gives me the right to keep the door closed. And I'm sad to say that some people do. Jesus comes to the heart, and you, you can put it in Revelation's symbolism if you want to, but this is real. This is the Son of God having already died on Calvary. And that punctuates it for me. How in the world, after Jesus has given everything, after he gave up heaven and came and pitched his tent next to mine and then gave his life in that horrible death, what in the world is, is he doing now knocking at my door? I tell you, this is a revelation of his love for us. He loves us enough that he died for us. And to be honest with you, that should be enough. After the death of Jesus on Calvary, we ought to be knocking at his door. We ought to be trying to find him. The world should be the path to wherever Jesus is. But instead, some of us are reluctant. Some of us, even after hearing the story, the pain and suffering that he went through, we are still reluctant, and so we stay in our own home. We will not venture out, and since we won't come, I don't know. I, I can't put myself in the place of Jesus, but if I try to imagine it, I can't imagine myself coming to your door after such a sacrifice. I'd wonder what was wrong with you. I'd wonder whether you knew what I'd just done for you. I'd wonder whether you understood that you were lost until I came and died in your place. 
I wonder whether you understood that without my living a perfect life, not one of you would have an opportunity to gain heaven. For all of our righteousness says are like filthy rags. Every good thing we've done, Jesus did what we could not do, put himself in our places so that he could put us in his place. And yet there are some who don't feel any inclination to move towards Jesus. So what does Jesus do? Does he sit down and say, forget about him? I don't know about you, I think it would be appropriate if Jesus said, that's it. <laughs> if that's not enough, I can't do any more. I think everyone would say, that's justified. But love doesn't make sense in a normal fashion. Love never stops giving. Love never stops reaching. And until we really understand what the love of Jesus is like, we cannot comprehend it all. But I tell you this, if Jesus did all he did and then comes to my door, I get another picture of who Jesus is. I, I'll tell you that I, uh, I think I have an insight into what Jesus goes through knocking on doors. I served uh, while I was a student at this very institution. I, I was what they called then a literature evangelist. Let me break that down. There are people who are listening who will not understand the euphemism. What it means is that you are selling books and periodicals door to door. It's called a cold call. It's the hardest thing a salesman has to do. To knock on a door, never having met the people before, it takes everything in you to be able to do it. Even great salespeople are reluctant to try it. In fact, these days, it almost never happens. Since 9-11, people don't open their doors so quickly. And so most companies have given up on cold calls. There are a few still out there. In fact, I, I don't want to sound braggadocious, but I think I still have enough left over that I might be able to get in a door or two. My father taught me some secrets. He said... Uh, when you go to the door, this is from another era, of course. He said, when you go to the door, knock on it and then step back. So that when they come to the door and look through the people, they can see all of you. They can see that you don't have a hidden weapon. They can see that you are a regularly formed human being. They can see your smile. They can understand what you are about. They can determine from your body language that you are not harmful. And so when they open the door after you've stepped back, then move as though you're going to come in whether they invite you or not. <laughs> Believe it or not, in the old days, that used to work. Many a time I had a big towering figure of a man just open his door because I was coming anyway. I moved like the door wasn't there. And he'd step back and let me in. And when I got in, he'd look surprised that he had done that was part of my method. But these days, unless you just want to, to give yourself up to punishment, unless you love rejection, nobody does cold calls. But here is Jesus doing the thing that makes you most vulnerable to the rejection of those whom you love. He comes and knocks on the door. In fact, I read just last night a, another version from a scholar who had studied the text, and he says that Jesus not only stands there and knocks, but he will not relent in his knocking. In fact, this writer said, Jesus is willing to let the dew wet his hair. In other words, he's willing to knock until nightfall. He doesn't just knocks, he calls your name at your door. And he does it because there is no pride in him that is greater than his love for you. So with his everything exposed, Jesus knocks on doors. And you can listen to this as though it doesn't matter if you want to, but the fact is that every individual under the sound of my voice has had the opportunity to have Jesus knock at your door. 
he knocks on these worship occasions. He knocks while you're sitting there nonchalantly. He knocks while you're worried about whether your clothes match. He knocks while you are thinking about who's sitting next to you. He knocks while you're not even comprehending the dynamics of worship in God's house. He knocks not because you deserve it. He knocks because he loves you. And his love will not let you go. Forgive me if I am shocked by it. I know me pretty well. The only one who knows me better than I do is God. But if I knew about me, what I know about me, I wouldn't knock at my door. <laughs> I'm not the one you're looking for to make up a perfect kingdom. But Jesus, knowing our imperfections, understanding our weaknesses, still loves us enough to expose himself to rejection. And he does it because he loves us. He, he is, in fact, a salesman. I, I want to get to that, but let me tell you something that Jesus wants to do that is not ordinary for a salesperson. The Bible says Jesus offers not only to come into your house, but he kind of wants to get to know you. He wants to share time with you. And I'm sure when you think about all the things you'd have to put away if Jesus knocked at the door. In fact, maybe that's why he's knocking so long. Maybe he hears the sounds of rearranged furniture. Maybe he knows that there are some things that can't stay out in the open if you're going to let him in. But he's knocking anyway. He understands that you may be trying to make adjustments, but his love does not focus on what you've got on your coffee table. His love focuses on you and how valuable you are to him. So it's not the things that surround you. In fact, he already knows those things. He has not come to your house because it's an example of perfect living. He's come to your house because his love will not let him leave you alone. And he knocks and he says, here's what I want to do. I, I'm not like a regular salesman. I don't want to burst your bubble. But when you are at the mall and the salesperson is acting like you are the only human being in the universe. And they do that for a while. Any good salesperson will focus on you. They will close out the world. And all of a sudden, you are the only person who exists. At least that's the way you're supposed to feel if it's a good salesperson. And for a moment, you say, oh, isn't this wonderful? You are transported into another existence. You're in a parallel universe. And all they think about is you. Oh, look at, you know, this matches your clothes. Have you ever thought about that? Let's put it up next to you. Isn't that something? And people are all around you, but they don't see them. They only see you. I hate to burst your bubble, but they really don't care about you. It's the sale. The only reason they're focused on you is because you got the money. If they thought you didn't have the money, you would blend into the crowd. Trust me. In fact, when they think you have the money and they think a contract is about to be signed, then all the focus is there. But as soon as the sale is consummated, you will drift back into the gray of anonymity. You don't matter because all they were about was the sale. Now, I hate to say that about everybody. There may be some salesperson who really likes you, but I doubt it. Jesus is not an ordinary salesperson. He's making cold calls, but he says, I don't want to just get in your house and sell something and get to the next door. I want to come in and get to know you. How in the world? Knowing as much as he already knows about me, how in the world can he want to get to know me better? What is it about me that would interest Jesus? And the answer is strange. He is inclined to us. There is something that draws him to us. It's not what we have done. It's not what we possess. It's not our status 
It's not any of the things that are normal. It's just that we are precious to him. So he is inclined to us, not because of us, but because of his love. And he says, I want to come in. I want to get to know you. Now, this next part is, uh, is not going to apply to everybody. He says, I want to eat with you. There are cultures where uh, we know that mealtime is not only about nutrition. In fact, uh, the struggle that I've had all my life with weight has much to do with the fact that eating is not only about just keeping body and soul alive. Eating in the community where I grew up meant way more than that. It was a social event. My grandfather could cook. My grandmother could cook. My grandmother made cornbread that she put in an iron container that looked like ears of corn. And she would pour cornmeal lovingly into each little place and when it popped out, it looked like cornbread shaped like corn. My brother and I were amazed at her love. In fact, there were times when we would, we would just sit there and watch her cook. I know you don't understand that. It's, a, it's something from days gone by. There's nothing that interesting about a microwave and a can opener. <laughs> but food processors notwithstanding, I used to watch my father, my mother, my grandfather, my grandmother prepare food with personal touch. There was love in the process. My grandmother made some cookies that tasted like angels had baked them. The only reason I didn't think they did is because I saw grandmother do it. My brother and I would sit there and she'd say, go out and play. We said, no. She said, but they're not going to be ready. So we'll stay. She'd get through mixing the batter. And we said, Grandmother, can I have it this time? And they can't get it. Oh, somebody knows. <laughs> My brother and I would fight over the turns. My turn. Leave me some. Yeah, okay. I'm going to leave you some, all right. We'd watch, and sometimes I'd sit there and watch my mother as I now watch my wife. You know, I, I, I hate it when people say that someone is a good cook and they gloss over it. In order to be a good cook, I believe you have to think through the whole process how much you love somebody. Because there's no joy in this. I, I've seen my wife do that little thing where you hold it like that and and nice in front of it. And I'm sitting there, Lord, please don't let her cut her fingers off. And, and what I'm thinking about that is she must really love us to go through this repetitive, boring process. You've got to be thinking not about what you're doing right now. You've got to be thinking about the finished product. You've got to be imagining what the aroma will be like when all of those things come together. And when a person is a good cook, they know how to love people. You've got to love people to cook well because only love can drive you to do those things. I've seen them. In fact, a couple of times I've tried. Somehow my love got lost in the process. <laughs> but cooking means love. And can you imagine that Jesus in his culture understands that one of the most intimate things that you can share with a friend is a meal. Now, if you are not part of one of those cultures, just hold on a minute. Go and do something for about five or ten minutes and come back and be with us because I know some of you have never understood this and never will. Uh, the upside for you is that you probably don't struggle with your weight. We who know that there's something more in food than nutrition kind of work with that because there are times when you eat when you're not hungry. You're not hungry physically, but you're hungry emotionally. You're hungry socially. You want to share something. I, I have shared food with people. My brother is the one who did it most because we were always together. We're not far apart in our birth dates, and, and so we eat things and not have to use words. We'd be eating some sweet potato pie. 
Oh, I hope you know what it tastes like. If you don't, you can go to your grocery store and find something that reminds you of sweet potato pie. It is not the genuine article, but my brother and I would get some sweet potato pie and sit at the table and look at each other. We just say, mm. And that had a whole paragraph in it. There was connection. My mom would put together beans and rice. Now, I know you think that's poor people's food. So I guess I am still very poor. Because when my wife puts her hand to it, and then let's not even talk about greens. Some of you don't even know what I'm talking about. You think I'm talking about salad. <laughs> I'm talking about kale and turnips and collards and, huh? There are ways that you can intermingle them and put them at the right temperature with just enough moisture. And after a while, they'll begin to drive you out of your mind. They'll seep all the way through the house. In fact, if you go to a place where a cook has been at work, the aroma is not only in the kitchen, it's in the living room drapes. It's in the sofa. It's in the carpet. And when you come in the house, they don't have to say, are you hungry? You may not have been hungry when you came in, but something happens when you get in there. And here's what Jesus is saying. I want to share that phenomenon with you. You go look it up if you think I'm adding something that's not there. Jesus is saying, I don't want to just pass through your house like an ordinary salesman. I want to share something intimate with you. And incidentally, if you don't have enough in your house to share, it just so happens that Jesus has been proven to be able to multiply what you've got to eat. Matthew chapter 14, starting about verse 14 or 15, you remember that there was a crowd gathered listening to him preach. And the disciples came and said, let them go because they're getting hungry. They're going to turn ugly on us. Jesus said, don't worry about it. Just tell them to sit down in organized fashion. Have we got anything? They said, well, all we got, Jesus, is a little boy with a lunch. He's got barley loaves and fish spread. And he said, just bring that to me, and I'll thank God before we begin. They said, we are in trouble. They did whisper to themselves and say, there's something wrong. He doesn't understand the disaster that is upon us. And what they didn't know was that Jesus had already thanked his father for multiplying a little boy's lunch. I wish I had been there. I wish I could have sat there and watched his hands as he broke those barley loaves and said, bring me another basket. And he kept breaking, bring me another basket. Until all of those men and their wives and their children, some estimate 25,000 human beings, all of them had been filled and there were baskets full left over. So if you invite Jesus to your house, you don't have to worry whether you're going to run out of food. All you got to do is say, Jesus, we don't have enough. Let him break up a few things. Yeah. You don't have to worry that your skill in the kitchen is not enough. You may remember that the disciples came back from fishing one day. Looked at the shore and saw food that was already cooked, a fire that was lit, and there was a meal that was ready to be eaten. And when they looked around to see who might have cooked it, the only one there was Jesus. So if you can't cook, bring him in the kitchen. If you don't have the skill, he can help you there. If you don't have the quantity, he can help you there. But what Jesus says is forget about the process. Let's enjoy together as mealtime comes. So scholars say he's not talking about some snack. He wants to come at the evening meal. He wants the chief meal, and he wants to sit there. What must it be like to look across a table into the eyes of Jesus and watch him taste something and nod his head approvingly? Wouldn't that make it taste a lot better? Now, you think I'm making too much of it? I am not. 
what Jesus wants with us. And I'm talking about you with all of your flaws, you with all of your hidden weaknesses. We try to hide from Christ that which he sees so easily. And all he asks is that you let him in. And he can make up for the difference. The meal will be the best that you've ever tasted if you let him get involved. And then you'll sit there together. And the intimacy of a meal will draw you together with Jesus. It's not what you have requested. It's what Jesus wants. Now, when you look at that, you've got to understand that cold call sales are still difficult. In fact, this is what amazes me when I look at the story. Jesus could have gone anywhere to show that he knocks on doors. Uh, when you look at this particular passage, you discover that he has come to a city called Laodicea. Laodicea is not the town you want to visit. Laodicea is not the state of the church at its best. In fact, there are seven churches in Revelation. They are so close to this passage that anyone will be able to find it. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. And there are some of these times, because every name of a church represents a time during the history of the church, all the way from the beginning to the very end. And if Jesus wanted to go to the best place with the greatest possibilities, he would not have started knocking on doors in the city of Laodicea. And incidentally, there was in fact a city, a very real city named Laodicea. Uh, one of the things that it was known for was its eye salve. I'll come back to that. It was a place where its main product was black wool. You know I want to talk about that for a minute, but I will pass it by. When anything black pops up, I want to get in there and connect with it, but I got to move, so here I go. You just remember what I might have said. In Laodicea, they believed that there was a vast wall and a marble theater. In fact, it was probably built on seven hills like Rome was. It was a significant city, but it was not known for being a great time in history. Laodiceans had one attribute that made Jesus have a hard time dealing with them. Jesus said to Laodicea, you are lukewarm. <laughs> I don't know about you, I, I grew up in a house that did not have full medical coverage. I'm giving you a minute to catch me. You know, there are houses now where you don't have to worry. You've got, your, got all kinds of coverage, and if something happens, you just dial a number or you rush somebody off to a, an emergency room your HMO or whoever it is will make sure that you are taken care of. Uh, we were under the grace plan. <laughs> I remember when my brother and I would get, uh, get hurt and have diseases, and you would think that somebody would call the hospital, but nobody had enough money to pay the bill. So my mom and dad would come up with remedies. Sometimes I was shocked. Sometimes I prayed, Lord, help us. <laughs> this does not seem even to me to be an adequate remedy. But if God knows you don't have it, God steps in and makes up for it. <laughs> and there were a lot of times when my parents' home remedies worked. I got a couple scars that I would not ordinarily have because there was no plastic surgery after the wound. But I'm still alive and I'm still functioning because God was in that process. The fact is that when you are under this coverage with Jesus and you have to remember that Christ can make up for it, that I'm looking now at families who don't understand that Jesus would come in 
even to Laodiceans who were lukewarm. There were times when we got sick and my mom knew how to, let me put this in a pretty way, knew how to help us expectorate the poisonous substance. Is that pretty enough? You may have to nudge somebody and tell them what I'm talking about. So she would say, drink this water. <laughs> no, no. She said, That's, that water will take care of the problem. It would be lukewarm water. It makes you sick at the stomach. Jesus says, Laodicea, there's something about you that I don't like. You're not cold. You're not hot. Incidentally, the church of Laodicea is now. So if you want to get angry with me, this is the moment. I am now preaching something that you probably won't like because it is addressed to us. I wish that I were not in the period of Laodicea. I wish I weren't in this time period that rep that's represented by lukewarmness. But I am. I'm a preacher to the church of Laodicea. I'm a member of the Laodicean church. I don't like it, but you can't get out of it. It's not a place you can leave. If I were to move, I'd say, send me to Philadelphia. Philadelphia's church was beautiful. There was nothing at all said that was negative about it. Everything was wrong with Laodicea. Nothing was wrong with Philadelphia. And so if I could move from one church to another, if I could pull myself out of time and put myself somewhere else, I'd put myself in the period of Philadelphia. In fact, if I were Jesus and I wanted to knock on doors, I'd go to Philadelphia and knock on doors. Because if you knock on doors in Philadelphia, you're liable to get a wonderful response. Somebody is liable to come to the door and say, Oh, Jesus, why did you knock? What did you just let us know where you were coming. We would have had the door open already. Come on in. Come, we'll have a wonderful time together. That's Philadelphia. But Laodicea is not only lukewarm. Incidentally, what it means is, that you're not cold, which means that you haven't turned away from religion, and you're not hot. And I wish I had time to talk about hot. I go to preach in places where the folks are hot. And all you got to do is make an announcement and they shout. <laughs> I pastored a church like that one time. It was sheer joy. I would get up and say, we're going to have prayer meeting this Wednesday night. And they say, yes, hallelujah. I told my wife, I hope they never move us from here. I love this church. These folk are excited. I'd watch them as they were on the way to worship. And sometimes I'd have a C-class sermon ready to preach. But as I watched them going on the way to church and looked at the excitement in their eyes and the expectation in their body language, I'd go to my study and upgrade my sermon before I got to the pulpit because I knew they deserved better than I had brought. They were hot. They loved Jesus and were not ashamed to let the world know. But what the Lord says about Laodicea is, you're not hot, you're not cold, you're somewhere in the mediocre middle. You know, sometimes when you think it's to your advantage, you sound hot. Most of the time, you sound cold. But because you are neither hot nor cold, and these are Jesus' words, I'll spew you out of my mouth. I don't want to be connected with you. My friends, I'm telling you, there's nothing worse than a neighborhood in Laodicea. Let me talk a little bit more about Laodicea because I've been to towns that were like this. Laodicea was poor, wretched, blind, and naked, but their perception of themselves was the opposite. They thought they were rich and increased with goods and in need of nothing. Can you imagine a worse situation? I met a man one time who had lived in a town which shall be nameless, and he said, Pastor, if you ever need anything in this city, don't ever ask the people who seem to have anything because they are only facade. I said, what do you mean? He said, you see those BMWs they drive? They can't afford them. He said, in fact, if they were to try to loan you $10, it would take their budget out of whack. He said, they've got big houses, but nothing's in them. 
They've got on clothes that look good, but their credit cards are overcharged to get them. And when you get in a neighborhood like that, you have found yourself in horrible territory. So when you go to the door in one of those houses, they're already mad because they can't pay their bills. You knock on the door and they say, who's that out there? Somebody selling something. And you can see the, the light change in the people. You know somebody's on the other side, you just can't see them. You see the blinds move just a little bit. So you know they're looking at you. You step back, try my daddy's move. It doesn't work. If you would have stepped back to the curb, they still wouldn't let you in. They can't afford anything you've got. I don't care what it is. If you're selling $10 Cadillacs, they can't afford one. So they don't want you in there. If you go to a neighborhood like that, you are in trouble. And yet, what I have to tell you today is that Jesus did not choose the church at its best time to come knocking on doors. If I had chosen, I'd have gone to Smyrna, preferably to Philadelphia, but never to Laodicea. And yet it is in our time. And let's face it, we are exactly what the Bible says we are like. We hate to admit it, we always want to say, look at all these Laodiceans around me. Wouldn't it be great if you had a mirror with you so you could look at another Laodicean? <laughs> we know that spiritually we are blind. Because if we weren't blind, we'd see ourselves as we are. Maybe the Lord gives us the luxury of not seeing everything about ourselves at one time. We might be too depressed to move forward, but we are certainly not able to see. So the Bible says when you go to Laodicea, buy that eye salve that they have. They specialize in it. Get that. Jesus says, when I come into your house, I know what your problems are. You're poor, but you don't know it. There's nobody so exasperating as somebody who's broke, but they won't admit it. You know, when you're broke, you ought to just go ahead and claim it. Embrace it. <laughs> Return a faithful tithe and see what God can do about it. But don't go around pretending that you're wealthy. It's too much of a strain on your personality. You go to places with folk and you're trying to determine who's going to pay the bill. You can barely eat. You almost get indigestion because you're trying to figure out who's going to pick up the tab. I know my wife and I have been to places like that where the menu was covered in pewter and we knew we shouldn't have been there. If there's somebody there live playing a piano, you know you're not supposed to be there. <laughs> I've nudged my wife many a time and said, baby, where are we going to eat? I said, I tell you what, let's say we're not hungry and get some salad. <laughs> I think I've got enough to do the salad. So when they come to ask, what will you have? Uh, I'm not that hungry. I bought a salad. <laughs> what would you like to drink? Uh, water with lemon. <laughs> it, it's, it's a strain to act like something you're not. In fact, I remember one time going out with a couple that was doing quite well, but I didn't know whether they would pay the bill or not, so we got salad and water with lemon, and then we got all the way to the end, and they said, oh, I forgot to tell you, we're picking up the tab. <laughs> and what I wanted to do was to rewind, <laughs> go back to the beginning so I could eat some of those wonderful things that I saw on the menu. It's a strain acting like you're what you're not. But we, Laodicea, act like what we're not. We're always around smiling, styling, and profiling. Even on Sabbath, we have our Sabbath module plugged in. We drive up with the car just washed. We get out of it, and if it's still looking fairly good, we make sure somebody sees us. 
open the door a couple of times and slam it again. <laughs> Say, oh, you've got a new car. Oh, just nothing. <laughs> Something to get from point A to point B. And you've, you've got on your best, but you don't want to repeat too many times. So maybe you ought to go here this weekend and there next weekend and there next weekend and hope nobody follows you so they'll never know you've got on the same suit. But it weighs down on you because you're trying to be something that you're not. And here is what Jesus says. If you let me in your house, I know what you need. You're broke. I will give you gold that's tried in the fire. That's what I've come to, to proffer. That's what I've come to offer to you. And, and what that goal represents is the faith that works by love. Jesus, once he's in your house, once you've had the meal, he says, I want to offer you some things. I want to give you gold that's tried, fired in the fire is how it literally reads. I want to give you a garment that you could never afford. In, in your town, almost everything you can buy is made of black wool because that's the, the prime product of your community. And so I will not give you what everybody else wears. And trust me, this is not a matter of difference in color. It's difference in the maker. Jesus says, I do not offer you clothes that are made in your town. I offer you clothes that were made on the loom of heaven. I offer you something that money can't buy. I've come to bring you something to cover your spiritual nakedness. I've come to give you eye salve. You can't see where you are. In fact, one of the reasons why Jesus is knocking on the door of your heart and mine today is because he sees in us flaws that will disqualify us to live in heaven. And he wants to correct them before God has to reject us. He presses to get into the house. He says, I'll give you gold that's fired in the fire. I'll give you garments that are not made in this town, not made on this earth, not made in this universe. I'll give you clothing that were made for you by divine power. I'll give you eye salve so that you can see. I want to make a perfect product of it. And when I leave, I don't want any of the deficiencies that you had that would disqualify you for heaven to still be here. So here's what I want. Let's talk for a while. Let's eat. I forgot to put in Swiss chard. A few of us have kind of caught on to that. He said, wasn't that good? I like that mixture with the Swiss chard mixed in. That's a wonderful meal, but now there's something I got to talk to you about. I love you, but you're poor. I love you, but you're naked. I love you, but you're blind. And I didn't come to criticize you. Let me show you what I brought. Here is a bar of gold. It's fired in the fire. It's pure. I can leave this with you. I've got a garment. I don't think you've ever seen anything like it. In fact, I brought something for the whole family. Could I show them to you? He pulls them out. He says, how do you like that? It's your size. We already did our investigations and our research. It's just perfect for every member of the family. I've got eye salve. In fact, you can use some now. Try it. If you put it in your eyes right now and just a little tiny massage and for the first time in your life you'll see things as they really are you'll notice that you're naked but as soon as you do you can grab the garment that I bought that is just your size go in your bedroom and put it on and come back out and let's see what you look like your whole problem has been that you didn't have anything to make you feel secure but my gold fired in the fire will take away your poverty and I have come to bring that for you so I not only came to know you and let you know I love you I not only came to 
be intimate with you with a meal. But I came to solve every spiritual dilemma you have. What I want to say to you today is that while you thought that Christianity was about going out and changing yourself, you thought that some book at Amazon.com would change your outlook on life, I'm not angry with reading self-help books, but nobody can change himself or herself. Nothing outside of you can make you what Jesus wants you to be until Jesus knocks at your door. And when he knocks, he comes in. He puts you at ease. He shares intimacy. And then he gets down to the real things that you could never provide for yourself. He brought you gold. He brought you clothes. He brought you eye salve. He brought everything you need to be ready to go to heaven. And he wants to make the change before it's too late. If you see what I'm talking about, can I hear you say amen? amen. So instead of you chasing him, folks, if, if the only people who went to heaven were people who chased Jesus, heaven would have echoes. How many of us really chase Jesus. Most of us determined to find Jesus when we got into some trouble that we could not extricate ourselves from. When nobody was there to help, when you couldn't afford the lawyer, when nobody could handle your case, when all of your family had turned against you, when your friends had put you down, when your credit union forgot who you were, when nobody cared about you, when you found yourself in a strange neighborhood with people who had nothing but acted like they had everything, a hypocritical community. But then Jesus broke every stereotype and came walking down your street one day and came to your door and knocked and said, may I come in? And I'll tell you this, if you let Jesus come into your house, before he leaves, it'll all be right. If you are like me, you've got a question in your mind. And the question is this. If I am poor and blind and wretched and naked, how do I buy what I need from this salesman? Isaiah 55, if you start right at verse 1, it says you can buy important things without money. But in this case, one of my favorite writers makes it extremely clear. The price that you pay for getting what Jesus has brought for sale is to turn away from everything that you thought precious to you, turn away from your own self-sufficiency. And if I were to describe Laodicea in simple terms, I would say that what we are about is self-sufficiency. Too many of us think that we're going to make it to heaven on what we've got. We're going to get better and better and better. I see people, I can read it in their eyes. They think that if they do certain things, if they dot certain I's and cross certain T's, they believe that if they think positively, if they get better from day to day, that somehow, miraculously, They'll be prepared to go to heaven based on what they have done. Self-sufficiency will never work. Jesus has the only life that can get you there. And I'm happy to tell you, I'm switching metaphors now, but try this one on for size. What Jesus is able to do is to go into your file and highlight your whole life. gets it all out there and when he has gotten your life from beginning to end with all of your righteousnesses in it he hits one button and it all goes away delete you say well preacher what does that leave me with that means I'm left with an empty file well for a moment you are but I'm happy to tell you that Jesus can leave your file and go over to his file and start copying from top to bottom. 
where he gets all the way down to his perfect life on earth, the whole thing. Then he hits another button, and you know what it is. Where is it? He copies your file, then he takes what's in his file and goes over to yours and hits the paste button. And all of a sudden, your life is no longer empty. You have the life of Christ in place of yours. And I promise you something, the only life that can get us into heaven is the life of Jesus Christ. He gives us the power to live. And so today I am, I am happy to be able to say that we do not have to pursue Jesus to have him in our lives. In fact, the converse is true. Jesus pursues us. He will come to your house. You say, well, all I got is an apartment. He will come to your apartment. All I got is a rented room. He'll come to your rented room. All I got is a hotel. He'll come to your extended stay hotel. He knows where you are. If you live on the street, if you live under a cardboard box that's put on top of a grate so that heat comes up and keeps you from freezing, he knows where your box is. And he'll knock until you let him in. And by the time he leaves, you'll have gold. You'll have garments. You'll have eye salve. You'll have everything it takes to have eternal life. And all you've got to do is let him in. Join us next time for more Breath of Life with Pastor Walter L. Pearson. Life is full of questions. Sometimes we don't know which way to go or where to turn. We have doubts and fears and we wonder what it all means. But there are answers. And there is hope waiting for you in God's Word, the Bible. And there's no better way to start exploring the plans He has for you than in the Discover Bible Guides. It's the Breath of Life gift offer this week and your ticket to the heart and soul of God's Word. These easy to read and illustrated Bible studies get to what's on God's mind for you quickly and clearly. You'll be enlightened by studies such as, Is God Fair? When Jesus Comes for You, The Secret of Answered Prayer, and Bridge to a Satisfying Life. Just call our toll-free number at one eight seven seven bol offer That's one 265 6333 And ask for your copy of the Discover Bible Guides. Or you may write to Breath of Life, P.O. Box 97192, Washington, D.C., 20077. To order a CD or audio cassette copy of this Breath of Life broadcast, just call our toll-free number, 877-BOL-OFFER. That's 877-265-6333. Or you may write to Breath of Life, P.O. Box 97192, Washington, D.C., 20077. The CD or audio cassette is yours for a gift of $5 or more. If you'd like to purchase a DVD or VHS copy, just let us know. Thank you for watching and supporting Breath of Life.